Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. We've got the XRP chart up here, guys, on the daily right now. XRP is trading just shy of 77 cents. Right now, it's trading at about 76.8. Throwing a Fibonacci here um, at the top of the last bull run down to the trough of the bear market. You can see the 0.236. We are bouncing below that level now, and um, so XRP is still forming higher lows. However, we are bouncing below that level. You guys can see over here, that level is forming resistance, has been... Um, for a couple of months now since February. So what that also means to me is that XRP is a very, very undervalued cryptocurrency, especially at this point in time. Um, we know the lawsuit likely had a lot to do with that. But if you guys are in the crypto space and you're um, investing in other coins, like for example, Cardano's ADA, Cryptocurrency, you guys can see um, if we were to take a look at that same price levels during the same period of time for Cardano's ADA, we are now hovering up here at the 0.702 for ADA. So whereas XRP was hovering below the 0.236, uh, you can see Cardano already very overvalued in comparison. Same thing for other cryptocurrencies like Ethereum. So here's Ethereum uh, on that same time frame, taking the Fibonacci from the top of the last bull market to the trough of the bear market. And you can see Ethereum also very overvalued in comparison. Let me just bring up Bitcoin for a second. And uh, here you guys can see Bitcoin on the daily trading right now at 41,800. I'm starting to believe that not only is this an accumulation phase, this could actually be a bear market. This could have been the corrective pattern that we have seen in past bear markets. However, it happened, I mean, seemingly happened, poof, like that, that we didn't even realize that. And I'm going to talk about this more in this afternoon's video. So come back later this afternoon, guys, uh, if you're interested. Uh, wanted to mention this, guys, from Matthew L-I-N-Y. This has to do with Ripple Partners Thunes. They have acquired a major stake in AML firm Tukitaki. So Singapore-based cross-border payments firm Thunes has paid $20 million for a majority stake in a local anti-money laundering and compliance technology company, Tuki Taki, interesting name, adding Tuki Taki to Thunes' global network addresses a need for fintechs and financial institutions to embed automated streamlined compliance processes with their payments processes. So it's looking as though the, um, the security sector is now integrating with the payments sector. And uh, I mean, it's a natural complement, I suppose, to that industry. With payments, you do need security. So Thunes' customers uh, already include money transfer operators like MoneyGram, Western Union, and Remitly, Neobank, Revolut, and fintech and mobile wallets, PayPal, Stingtel Dash, uh, M-Pesa, and Airtel. The company tracks over 180 million transactions annually. Now these guys, Thunes, who are Ripple-enabled, are partnering with a security firm. So uh, interesting to see how that development plays out. I wanted to thank Matt for posting that. Also saw this, guys, from T-Hole Bedic XRP. Two Ripple partners, Unicredit and Worldline, they are now collaborating to extend their partnership for open banking. So Unicredit, one of the major pan-European banks, has renewed the partnership with Worldline, a global leader in payment finance, for open banking third-party provider services. The partnership with Worldline allows Unicredit customers to connect their accounts in other banks throughout Europe via one single application program interface. Uh, this enables Unicredit to effectively offer account information services and payment initiation services and opens up a range of business opportunities for both Unicredit and its customers. Uh, Unicredit has been using Worldline's open banking TPP service since 2020, and the partnership has been extended for another two years. So these two Ripple partners, obviously, Obviously seeing the benefit in collaboration. They are seeing how this is becoming a cost-effective uh, solution, enabling new services to further support their growth. And the partnership with Worldline provides huge benefits in terms of efficiency as well. Instead of establishing separate connections with many different banks, Unicredit gains extensive and cost-effective reach throughout Europe through their single API. This removes the complexity and friction of many diverse integrations and allows Unicredit to provide its customers with the ability to get a consolidated view on all their bank accounts held with one or more banks. It also enables them to initiate an online payment for an account from other banks in Europe. Uh, in addition, Worldline's open banking TPP service allows Unicredit to discover new business opportunities to develop new services to the benefit and corporate and the individual customers too. So I don't know if you guys remember, there were seven leading banks that did join Ripple's global network back in 2016. And uh, Unicredit, if I'm not mistaken, was one of those banks. Yeah, right down here, Santander, Unicredit, uh, UBS, Reese Bank, CIBC, National Bank of Abu Dhabi, and ATP Bank. So Unicredit uh, has been a Ripple partner since 2016. 
And back in 2021, Worldline, they uh, also signed on to become a RippleNet member. So uh, again, two Ripple partners creating that synergy that we are going to see uh, more and more, I think, moving forward. The secondary and tertiary partnerships, this has been the theme coming out of 2021 and into 2022. This is where we are going to see more XRPL value derived from and thus more value for the XRP token moving forward once the liquidity kicks in. So great news there. Wanted to thank T. Holbedic XRP for posting that. And another one here, guys, from the Wrath of Kahneman with regards to smart sync services. Okay, this is all happening in India. They noted that Intellect Design Arena or IGTB has worked with Ripple pilots in their quarter 2022 report, noting crypto adoption has been slow in India. However, uh, the company has done pilot partnerships with Ripple. So they are noting that Ripple was a possible solution, but the adoption is still very slow here in the blockchain space for the company to make a big venture into it. So this is all coming from the smart sync services quarter one fiscal year 2022 report results and conference call that they had with their uh, with their shareholders. I will link this report guys in the description of the video, but just interesting to note here that they did mention Ripple in terms of a pilot project that they did do in the past. However, they are noting as well that uh, crypto and blockchain adoption still really hasn't come to fruition in India in a, in a meaningful capacity, at least not as of yet. So we're gonna keep our eyes on this. Thanks so much to the Wrath of Kahneman for posting that. And again, guys, all the links to all the resources are in the description of the video. I wanted to bring your attention to this next, guys, the latest update with regards to the SEC lawsuit. James K. Filan just recently posted this. Court denies the Ripple defendant's motion to strike the Mets report and reopens discovery until May 13th to redepose Dr. Metz. So the SEC ordered to pay a reasonable expenses fee. So uh, it looks as though they got a fine regarding filing the motion and redeposing Dr. Metz. So likely they will just have to pay for the office space and for his time. Um, so a small, a relatively small fine, I suppose, in the eyes of the SEC. James K. Filing continues by saying the court criticizes the SEC, finding that the SEC has conducted itself improperly by serving an unauthorized supplemental report on the last day of discovery, but declines to strike the Mets supplemental report. Anders L. chiming in on this, uh, I think the Mets report will actually hurt the SEC since Ripple will be able to easily disprove the arguments made and thus the SEC can't prove the efforts of others in the Howey test. Let's not forget, Mets has already been deposed. So his bag of tricks is already out there in the open. And uh, if Ripple's lawyers are clever enough, they'll be able to now formulate questions um, in the supplemental deposition to be able to negate what they already know that he has already put on the record. So. It's gonna be interesting to see how this plays out, probably why they tried to sneak it in on the last day, uh, knowing it's weak and can't be defended. The SEC seems to like that, like the lawsuit itself. Uh, XRP Crypto Wolf just chiming in on this, SEC's shady behavior is getting annoying with all these petty delays. They should have never sued Ripple over XRP, of course. I think we're all feeling a little bit of that XRP Crypto Wolf Moon Lambo down here saying, you know, thanks for sharing, James, but I think something's wrong. Only the top third of the page loads. Uh, okay, so that has to do with this Dropbox link here. Let me just click that. Um, I, again, everything's linked in the description, guys. I'm seeing it here. It's looking as though we've got everything here. Yeah, right down to the bottom. So um, this link in the description of the video for you guys. Uh, XRP Crypto Wolf also just uh, bringing up this article, summarizing what is happening here. So the SEC allowed to file a supplemental expert report. Expert discovery was originally supposed to end on January the 14th, if you guys remember, but there's been a lot of disputes and a lot of uh, delays and extensions. As reported by you today, Ripple moved to strike the new rebuttal report by securities and finance expert Dr. Metz last month. It described the report as impermissible, arguing that the new version of the report didn't bring anything new to the table. Ripple claims that the SEC wasn't supposed to have the final say in the discovery process. So that was the other thing. Uh, Ripple's lawyers were, I guess, supposed to have the final say in this. And uh, now, because they are filing this report, Dr. Metz, uh, and by extension, the SEC will actually have the final say. The report in question is meant to show the economic significance of Ripple's public announcement with the regards to the performance of the XRP token. The discovery deadline has now been pushed to May 13th. So another three weeks is that, three weeks roughly. Uh, today is April the 20th, 2022. Okay, let's talk about how this could affect the case. Jeremy Hogan here, bringing in his two cents. This type of ruling drives me crazy in my own practice and no less here. 
What good is an order deadline if it's not enforced? Very, very good question. We've had all these deadlines come and go and um, you know, it, it always just seems like the SEC is finding another way, another reason to extend these deadlines. Obviously their delay tactics are becoming very, very apparent now. And uh, I think there's good reason why. I understand the judge wants to preempt issues on appeal, but this was so blatant that I hoped she would do more than force the SEC to pay some additional dinero, cash, fiat currency, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and so he's just uh, retweeting out James K. Filan's tweet that I just read to you. Jeremy Hogan continuing by saying, but at the end of the day, this won't change any of the final court dates. And that seems to be what Judge Netburn thinks is the most important factor. So it sounds as though that those court dates are going to remain um, concrete. Uh, it's just my pet peeve. He goes on to say, an order is an order. Grr, okay, I'm good. Calm and good now. Deep breath in. Okay, and breathe. <laughs> Let's keep going. XRP Crypto Wolf down here um, responding. You know, Judge Netburn needs to sanction and punish the SEC. I don't understand how any judge could go through all this back and forth without getting mad. I have no doubt that she's probably a little miffed. And I think we're already leaning in the direction of Ripple, but um, you know how court cases go. We still have to go through the motions. Jeremy Hogan responding, well, to be fair, she did sanction them probably a couple of thousand bucks, again, uh, likely for Dr. Metz's time and uh, the, the location fee, and um, I guess if they're getting a videographer to film the deposition, maybe for the videographer's time uh, and all that, but what does the SEC care when they have millions of dollars at their disposal? Your taxpayer money hard at work to protect you guys, remember that. Louis Torres down here saying, uh, Jeremy, do you think we are still on for summary judgment date on Friday? Jeremy Hogan responding, Friday is the day the parties are supposed to provide a schedule for briefing summary judgment motions. They won't be briefed until this summer though. So it's looking as though we are continuing to trudge through this. Uh, the latest update here, Bill Asarius, 2020, on Twitter saying, thanks James, the SEC has a win and gets a slap on the wrist for breaking the rules in order to pay some of Ripple's costs. Ripple gets to redepose Mets and file a supplemental report, which was the outcome I considered was very likely. And Jeremy Hogan just uh, responding down here, you called it on the Dr. Metz supplemental report. Your tweet was the order. So more discovery, um, and this is what gives Ripple's lawyers, like I said before, an upper hand, because they already know Metz's point of view. They already have seen his original report. So now they can come back and now they can formulate their questions if they're clever, which I'm sure they are. I have confidence in the Ripple legal team. Um, they can formulate their uh, questions to kind of get out of him what they want. It does give them the upper hand, um, but I do think this is, again, a delay tactic and uh, they're reopening Discovery. So now it's going until May 13th. It's okay though, guys, it really is okay. We are coming to the end of this. And uh, again, I'm of the opinion that we are going to see XRP soar after this, but not only that, I think that's the obvious thing. I think we actually could see a cryptocurrency altcoin surge because of this specific lawsuit, because there are so many cryptocurrencies in the space that by extension will have gotten clarity by this SEC lawsuit. And so I think we could be at that inflection point where once we get this lawsuit settled, we are going to see other coins just shooting up left, right, and center. And that is what uh, could possibly create that cryptocurrency frenzy. The next six to 12 months alongside some other things uh, that I've been talking about over the last few days, I'll link a video up here uh, from yesterday afternoon if you guys didn't catch that one. Talking about the crypto price and uh, where we are situated today, where we could be going in the future based on geopolitical events and uh, other factors as well. Okay, let me continue guys because John Deaton also brought up something that I think we should be very, very excited about considering where this lawsuit is going and uh, you know where we've come, where we've been, where we're going, all that stuff. Regardless of anyone's opinion on Judge Netburn or her recent rulings, she gave us two absolute gems that will appear in our amicus brief. So let's not forget what Judge Netburn did originally state the court. She says, my understanding of XRP is that not only does it have a sort of currency value, which we all know it does considering it has a market price, the free market decides on what XRP trades for, but it also has utility and that utility distinguishes it, I think, from Bitcoin and Ethereum. It has a currency value and it has utility. So the judge is really getting a sense of why this cryptocurrency is important and why it should not be considered a security. It does perform a use case, it does solve a problem. And so, um, you know, getting 
the definition down, I think, is half the battle. Also this, presumably under this theory, then every individual in the world, so people selling XRP, right? Regarding its security status, presumably under this theory, every individual in the world who is selling XRP would be committing a Section 5 violation based on what you just said. So all of us guys, all of us who sell, buy and sell XRP, would be committing a Section 5 violation. Well, if we're living in the United States, those of us living in other countries, maybe not, but that means that everybody selling XRP would be committing a violation under the Securities Act, which seems a bit preposterous, doesn't it? So these are two very, very good signals that we've seen filed by Judge Netburn. Two gems that I think point in the right direction for XRP hodlers. Jeremy Hogan also just chiming in on this. When the judge told the SEC lawyer that based on his argument, every person who buys XRP is breaking the law, my jaw almost hit the floor. So again, this is judge speak for, I think that is a ridiculous argument, SEC. Uh, that was the best part of the case for me. Glad it's making it into your brief. Interesting to say the least, and uh, guys, don't think that the people over there at the Ethereum Foundation have a free pass forever. They might have one for now, but here's another clip uh, just posted uh, by John Dean retweeting out a digital asset buys tweet here. This clip should give Ethereum founders nightmares. If you had just taken your Ethereum free pass and kept your mouths shut, you know who you are. The SEC has some face saving to do. We don't go away until there's a level playing field. Let me play you guys this. This is Jay Clayton in a recent interview. Listen to this. You are going to see um, similar companies not subject to the same uh, scrutiny from a enforcement point of view. And it's just a matter of jurisdiction, bandwidth, and the like. There's, there's no inherent unfairness in that. It's, you know, who draws the attention, et cetera. And people, people who are, um, you know, similarly situated and one is uh, subject to uh, a regulatory action in some jurisdiction and the other isn't, the one who isn't, you know, maybe getting a pass for the moment doesn't mean they're gonna get a pass over time. In fact, if, if you see someone who is a similar situated product, you know, subject to an enforcement action, you better expect that that may come for you. Oh, so Ethereum free passers might not get or retain their free pass in perpetuity. This is what Jay Clayton is saying here in this interview. And maybe he's saying this because of the way the Ripple lawsuit is going. We don't know, but things are gonna change. I can feel it. That's just my opinion, but I wanna hear what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you have not already. Guys, I really wanna try to hit 100,000 subscribers by the end of the year. I think we can do it, so please subscribe if you guys are finding yourselves watching the video and you're not subscribed yet. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.